Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. And I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, a tragic crash leaves a little girl dead. No parent is supposed to bury their child. A driver loses control and slams into a girl guide troop in London, Ontario. That's a city still reeling months after a hate-fueled hit and run. Questions and confusion about Canada's new travel rules. I want to a couple more trips this, like, in like, 2022. I don't know if I'll be able to. With more cases and more restrictions, travelers rethink those holiday flights. A rare moment of unity in Parliament. Political people in this country do not want to be on the record anymore opposing LGBTQ2 issues. Parties come together to ban conversion therapy. I just never got better. And the long road back from long COVID. I'm pretty motivated because I looked at this as a big opportunity. The Canadian patients and doctors determined to beat the debilitating effects of COVID-19. This is The National. Well, tonight, London, Ontario is once again dealing with tragedy, trying to make sense of a crash that took a little girl's life. She was just eight years old and walking in a group of children when a vehicle suddenly struck them. This has led to an outpouring of grief in a city still on edge after another deadly crash less than a year ago. This time, there is no suggestion that this crash was intentional. But as Ellen Morrow shows us, that doesn't lessen the pain. <laughs> Gestures of mourning at the crash site. Flowers and teddy bears placed where an eight-year-old girl's life was ended. This community devastated. It's my neighborhood. I'm a mom. I, I love my city. And this breaks my heart. No, no parent is supposed to bury their child. A local girl guides group was walking along this stretch of sidewalk at exactly the wrong time. The tragedy began at about 6.45 last night. A car coming through that intersection there behind me, hitting at least one other vehicle, a light post and a small tree before ramming into the pedestrians, along with the eight-year-old who died from her injuries. Nine others were struck, their ages ranging from six to 40 years old. Andrea Parsons was the first to lay flowers. I started crying when I heard about the little girl because I just thought it's right close to Christmas. Like the poor parents, they probably bought a present. It just, it just breaks, breaks my heart. A neighbor of mine saw them walking along in their brightly colored snowsuits just before it had happened. Grant Beamish saw the horrific aftermath. It was tragic and, and I mean, I was also thinking about the little ones who hadn't been injured because they're witnessing this. And I mean, these were little girls. Remnants of the crash remain. A 76-year-old woman was behind the wheel. Police say there's no evidence this was an intentional act. There are no arrests and no charges laid. This is an ongoing investigation. Nerves are still frayed in the city after a Muslim family was killed in the spring. A London man accused of running them down with his vehicle in an act of hate. Boy, what a year it's been. And this is when we need our, our fellow Londoners to rally to come together and uh, support each other. Be kind, be careful. London's mayor paying his respects alongside Ontario's premier. This is such a tragedy. Uh, I want to give my condolences, my prayers and thoughts to the little girl's family. A family now left to cope with the unthinkable. Okay, so Ellen, what do we know about the conditions of the other injured people? Well, Andrew, police put out a statement this morning listing the injured in either fair or good condition. Some have since been released from the hospital. The 76-year-old uh, woman behind the wheel was never brought to hospital with any injuries. And police are not speculating at all on the cause of this horrific chain of events, whether mechanical failure with the car, a medical condition, something else. Not speculating, just emphasizing there's no evidence to suggest this was an intentional act, but rather it appears a horrific accident. Him. Okay, Ellen Morrow in London, Ontario. Thanks. You're welcome. There are now nine confirmed cases of the new Omicron variant in this country, with pair of new infections announced in Alberta. We have identified an additional two cases in a recently returned traveler from South Africa and the Netherlands and a household contact. With three Omicron cases and COVID numbers rising overall, Alberta is now opening up more third shots. 
We're expanding access to booster shots to all Albertans aged 18 and older. And tomorrow, Ontario is expected to expand its booster eligibility as well to anyone 50 and older. Of course, that does mean tapping the national vaccine supply. The Prime Minister says Canada can handle it. There is not an issue about quantity of vaccines. We have lots of vaccines. And today, the U.S. announced its first so Omicron case, so with officials urging eligible Americans to get their booster shots. For Canadians desperate to get away, this potentially dangerous new variant hits at the worst possible time. And just as Ottawa imposes new airport rules, all international travellers, except from the U.S., required to get tested and then isolate until they get results. Jacqueline Hansen looks at what this means for holiday plans. A familiar air of uncertainty for Canadian travellers. We got home just in time before I think everything kind of goes downhill again. Airlines and the travel industry had just been starting to take off again. With this latest variant, it's just a hit um, sliding us backwards. While most flights in and out of Canadian airports are still domestic and not subject to the new restrictions, international trips are beginning to ramp back up. In October 2020, the Vancouver airport saw just 16,000 people arrive from international locations other than the U.S. This year, 70,000. Still far below the 250,000 pre-pandemic, but enough to potentially make widespread on-site testing complicated. The Canadian Airports Council says the only operationally feasible way is to provide off-site tests. Either way, it could make some travellers think twice. Every time something like this happens, I think it just shakes the psyche of every traveller. So far, the new changes don't apply to travellers coming from the US, but that could change. We need to be prepared and ready if we need to adjust uh, that decision. Some hope the testing is seen as an added layer of protection. The whole point of all this is about um, you know, making sure that people feel safer when they are traveling, and I think it's better than closing the borders. Though the past week is proof that the rules can change quickly. The international travelers are extremely concerned now that they'll go to a country that ultimately could get closed down. Potentially putting travel plans for the holidays and even the new year in jeopardy. I want to a couple more trips. This is like in like 2022, but with the new variant, I don't know if I'll be able to. Leaving COVID weary would be travelers wondering when they will truly be in the clear. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Now, in British Columbia, relief is finally on the horizon with rain expected to taper off overnight tonight. As the third of three major storms passes through, officials are watching water levels closely, hoping dikes and dams recently fortified will hold. The province is still largely paralyzed with important highways closed and complicating things an unusually warm day, bringing with it snowmelt and even the possibility of avalanches. Renee Filipponi now on the dangers that still linger. It's constant work for Dave Smith to protect his home in Mission as the lake level off his backyard keeps rising. And this morning it uh, it's rose, sorry, it's rose uh, eight feet off the sidewalk there. He's managed to keep the water out, but just, and it's nerve wracking. I put the sandbags and plastic on and then I just pump it out and it maintains it. Not far on Hatsik Island, an entire mobile home park has been evacuated as the rising river flooded trailers. There's more rain coming. And again, it's gonna take the time for the rain to come down out of the valley through all the rivers and all the tributaries. The latest atmospheric river created major delays on Highway 7 after a landslide early in the day. This is the same stretch of highway where hundreds were trapped between two slides in the first storm. It was eventually cleared, but not without damage. There's a lot of water coming over the road uh, and potholes everywhere, cars on both sides of the road missing tires. And Hence the reason I'm parked here now, I've got bent rims. This is supposed to be the highway. And more flooding forced the closure of Highway 3 near Princeton, an essential link between the Lower Mainland and the rest of Canada. Residents blame a dike damaged in the last flood that hasn't been repaired. We shouldn't be shocked because this is the second time we've been hit in two weeks, but, uh, you know, we thought we would be good. Take care. 
In Abbotsford, police continue to control access to evacuated areas and say the next 24 hours are critical. And it'll really depend on how high uh, the Sumas River rises or if it maintains the height that it's at and goes to the Fraser, we're in good shape. Along with record rainfall in places like Abbotsford, it's also been warm. But even though it may not be actively raining, there is a lot of rainwater and snow melt that is still making its way down from the mountains. So while it may be the last major storm in the forecast, its full impact has not been felt yet. Okay, and Renee, you're in Abbotsford tonight, uh, about as far as you can make it on the Trans-Canada right now. Any idea when that will change? Well, Andrew, I'm on North Parallel Road, and behind me you can see where police are blocking access to Highway 1. Now, this is a major stretch of highway between Abbotsford and Chilliwack, and crews have been doing what they can to ensure the integrity of the stretch of road. And they've been using massive inflatable dikes to do it. Now, it appears that it has worked, but the province doesn't want to take any chances. So it will wait till this storm has passed and the river levels have stabilized before reopening this road. But right now, we just don't know exactly when that will happen. Andrew? Okay, thanks, Renee. And as you saw there, with major routes still, still seriously disrupted, the movement of goods in BC has, in some cases, been slow to a crawl. And as Susanna De Silva shows us, that is taking its toll in different ways. Running out for errands is a bit more challenging these days. Perhaps it's some Christmas shopping. We have some ornaments that aren't here yet, some pottery, uh, some bath stalls. Dinner at the restaurant next door. Shortage of um, pork, uh, pig ears and uh, pork butt. Or grabbing groceries a few doors up. We had it in Friday. First time we've seen chicken in 10 days. Pandemic supply chain challenges that already existed made worse with farms underwater and rail lines and highways closed. Yeah, okay. This grocery store manager spends his days scouring inventory slips and calling suppliers. And while he has the majority of his items, he's never quite sure what or when things will arrive. It's stressful trying to please your customer day in and day out when you don't have what they want. Many BC shelves are missing certain items at certain times. Prices have gone up and some retailers have reintroduced buying limits on certain products. At this bakery, flour is their problem. Their supplier is in Chilliwack and relies on wheat from the east. I drove to Pasco and I went three times in a couple of days just trying to stock every corner of our bakery is full of flour right now because um, we just don't know how long it's gonna last for. How long is the big question. It actually demonstrates uh, the importance of having alternative kind of supply chain, having more local supply chains, building some resiliency in our own supply chains. But for now, businesses and customers have to adjust. There you go, darling. At the bakery, they are also absorbing the increased cost of flour for now. I try not to think about it too much because I don't know what else. I, I have so little control, right, as a small business. So they try to focus on what they can control, serving the customers they have now. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. And in Newfoundland, some welcome news tonight for residents of Porto Basque. They are no longer cut off from the rest of the province. A single lane of the Trans-Canada Highway has now reopened, allowing people to once again drive out. Sections of the highway were washed away by a fierce rainstorm last week that also disrupted marine Atlantic ferry crossings. Well, applause erupted in the House of Commons today after a bill to ban conversion therapy passed unanimously. Conversion therapy aims to change someone's sexual orientation or gender identity. It is considered harmful by many. David Cochran shows us a rare display of unity on Parliament Hill. Mr. Speaker, I'm asking for unanimous consent to adopt the following motion. A surprise move from the Conservatives to fast-track the ban on conversion therapy. There being no dissenting voice, I declare the motion carried. After years of fighting, it passed in mere seconds, leading to rare handshakes, even hugs, across party lines. I dream of a day when our LGBTQ2 issues are no longer political footballs, and we are one day closer to that future. It's just a wonderful day for um, kids growing up in a world that I didn't grow up in. And... Um, it's a pretty great day.
It's also a pretty great day for Matt Ashcroft. There's a bunch of survivors that grinded every single day to see, see this legislation passed in the House. Ashcroft has been lobbying for this ban after experiencing conversion therapy six years ago and being told he was gay because of an overprotective mother and an absent father. It is harmful, it is painful, and, and it needs to end, and it hopefully will end. A version of this legislation passed last summer, but it was back to square one because of the election. And I'm really happy that my colleagues across all benches have agreed with on this, and it's unanimous. NDP support was never in doubt. The Conservatives were the surprise. 62 of their MPs voted against it last time. This time, not a word of opposition and few words of explanation. We had discussion in the caucus. When the, we left uh, the caucus, the leader at the press conference, saying that we are open to accelerate uh, the process, and uh, you have seen uh, what accelerate means. The question now is whether they can accelerate it through the Senate and make it the law of the land. The justice minister says the Senate leadership has assured him that they will push it through as fast as they can. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. In the United States, the Supreme Court is again considering the issue of abortion, with arguments over a law that could ban the procedure after 15 weeks. Katie Simpson found both sides making their own cases outside the court. A society that didn't support my mother doesn't deserve to exist. The weight of this moment made for tense exchanges in front of the Supreme Court. Thousands of protesters on both sides of this debate acutely aware of what's at stake. I feel like this is a moment in history. We do not think we need abortion to be successful, and abortion hurts women, and women deserve a lot better than that. I feel frustrated um, and also confused. I don't really understand why people care, uh, what other people do with their bodies. Demonstrators set up speakers to listen to the proceedings here, but competing chants drown much of it out. The court is weighing arguments on a Mississippi law that bans abortion after 15 weeks. It's a challenge to the landmark Roe versus Wade decision, which prevents states from banning abortion before the point of fetal viability, roughly the 23 or 24 week mark. During two hours of arguments, the conservative majority on the court appeared open to supporting the Mississippi law. If it really is an issue about choice, why is 15 weeks not enough time? Abortion bans have got to go! It's unclear if the majority will go further and overturn the Roe versus Wade decision, which would allow states to ban abortion outright. Anti-abortion activists are more hopeful than ever, as the three judges appointed by former President Donald Trump appear sympathetic to their cause. It certainly is the best chance in a generation. If the justices are true to their oath to up uphold and defend the Constitution, Roe will be overturned. But there is a warning the court's reputation will be damaged if its position changes because of its new members rather than legal arguments. Will this institution survive the stench that this creates in the public perception that the Constitution and its reading are just political acts. So, Katie, you're just outside the U.S. Supreme Court. What happens now? It's a waiting game now, Adrian. It will be a few months before the court's decision is released. States that want to ban abortion have long prepared for the potential in this moment. At least 20 have passed pieces of legislation known as trigger bills. If at any point Roe versus Wade is overturned, they immediately kick into effect and ban abortion. Women's rights advocates say it would be devastating. So the next few months will be a mix of anxiety and hope in this divisive debate. Adrian. All right, thank you. That's Katie Simpson at the U.S. Supreme Court in Washington. Well, Ukraine is asking for Canada's help. It wants this country's military to make its mission there more than just a training operation, as Russia appears poised to move in. Chris Brown has that story from NATO's conference in Latvia. A snowstorm blanketed Riga, where NATO's foreign ministers had gathered. By the time it was over and the ministers were done talking... The result was a passionate call for Russia to leave Ukraine alone. The message is that it's only Ukraine and 30 NATO allies that decides when Ukraine is ready to join NATO. Russia has no veto, Russia has no say, and Russia has no right to establish a severe influence trying to control their neighbors. 
Russia is holding military exercises along Ukraine's border, but NATO claims it's also building up tens of thousands of troops covertly, possibly to attack or intimidate Ukraine into moving away from the West. Ukraine wants to join NATO, and its foreign minister was invited here and met Canada's Melanie Jolie. We think that uh, our countries can do more in the sphere of defense. Canada already has a strong military presence in Eastern Europe, leading a 500-member battle group in Latvia and a 200-person mission in Ukraine to train its soldiers. Dmitry Kuleba says he'd like Canada to send more troops and expand what they do. We uh, are interested in the continuation and expansion of this program. He wouldn't say more than that, but whatever he and Jolie talked about, she sounded open to it. Ukraine is always looking for more capacity, and in that sense, uh, as Canada has always been shoulder to shoulder with Ukraine, we're very close to, uh, to them when thinking of what are the next steps. President Vladimir Putin often talks about red lines that Russia won't let NATO cross. Those include a guarantee Ukraine will not be admitted to the alliance, nor host foreign troops or missiles. The message from NATO is that it's not making any promises. Chris Brown, CBC News, Riga. Former fashion mogul Peter Nygaard is awaiting trial in Toronto, but his accusers in Winnipeg want to know why it's not happening there. You hear those words, no, we're not going to move forward. How? How, how can you make that decision? And I got, I was mad. Next, the Fifth Estate investigates why he wasn't charged in his hometown. The Canadians still suffering long after COVID-19. I got sick and then I just never got better. Doctors are trying to reimagine how we treat long haulers. And later, an emotional Alec Baldwin speaks for the first time since that deadly movie set shooting. He says he didn't pull the trigger. We're back in two. This was an evil act. And it appears to be random. Authorities in Michigan are still searching for a motive in a school shooting that has now claimed the lives of at least four students. Today, the 15-year-old gunman was charged as an adult with multiple counts of murder and attempted murder along with one count of terrorism. A major move by the Women's Tennis Association. It has suspended all tournaments in China and Hong Kong amid growing concern for Chinese player Peng Shui. The 35-year-old took part in a video call with Olympic officials last month, but has otherwise dropped out of view after accusing a former Chinese government official of sexual assault. The WTA says there's still serious doubt that she is safe and is calling for a full and transparent investigation before tournaments resume. Tonight, two Winnipeg women are demanding answers after their allegations of sexual assault against a former fashion mogul did not lead to criminal charges. Right now, Peter Nygaard is awaiting trial for alleged sexual assault, but that's in Toronto. He's also been charged in New York over allegations of sex trafficking. So why no charges in Nygaard's hometown? As part of an investigation by the Fifth Estate, Caroline Bargut shows us what those Winnipeg women have to say. I reached out to the Winnipeg police and had I think two, maybe three lengthy discussions on the phone, and then uh, Detective Shuchuk flew out to Vancouver to interview me and my mother on camera. And I thought, oh my goodness, stuff is gonna happen. Wearing Nygaard clothing. April Tellick of Vancouver says she was sexually assaulted and held against her will for days by Peter Nygaard in 1993, after he invited her to Winnipeg for a modeling job. But when the Crown did finally get back to her, it wasn't the news she was hoping for. I was told that at that time they were not going to move forward with criminal charges against Nygaard on my behalf. And I was gutted. I phoned the Winnipeg cop shop and said I'm coming in and I'm pressing charges. Casey Allen also went to the Winnipeg police and alleged Nygaard had sexually assaulted her 40 years ago. But she was also told the Crown wasn't proceeding on her allegations. To learn that the Toronto police and court system found six victims in Toronto to be more credible and charge worthy than the eight 
Winnipeg victims is a disgrace. The Manitoba prosecutor's office declined to comment. But in response to the Fifth Estate, the Winnipeg Police Service say they referred eight cases to Manitoba prosecutors. However, after review, the Crown declined to authorize criminal charges against Mr. Nygaard. You hear those words, now we're not going to move forward. And, and then I had to ask them, I, how, how, how can you make that decision? And I got, I was mad. I was really mad, actually. Peter Nygaard denies all of the allegations against him. He's awaiting trial in Toronto on six counts of sexual assault and is facing possible extradition to New York to face sex trafficking charges. Caroline Bargut, CBC News, Winnipeg. The Fifth Estate's investigation called Why Not in Winnipeg airs Thursday at 9 on CBC TV 930 in Newfoundland. Well, next on The National, trying to treat COVID long haulers. You have to rebuild your body, and for me it's going to take probably six to eight months just to be able to walk normally. We'll take you inside the rehab centers trying to help Canadians still suffering long after the virus. And when fog forced a Canadian Armed Forces helicopter to make an emergency landing in BC, they had no idea what was going to happen next. An outpouring of kindness ahead in tonight's moment. Welcome back. The battle against COVID-19 has been one of near constant change, from the record-breaking development of effective vaccines to the string of unpredictable variants, such as the latest one, Omicron. But for those with a certain form of the condition known as long COVID, little ever changes. They don't seem to get better, and they don't know why. Christine Birak takes us inside the fight to change that. <laughs> From afar, you might mistake Katie McLean for someone much older than she is. For me personally, it's really turned my life upside down. McLean was a healthy, active 42-year-old with a full-time job in Vancouver when she tested positive for COVID-19. More than a year later, McLean hasn't recovered. She's struggling with long COVID. Even though I wasn't hospitalized, I got sick and then I just never got better. So I'm that person that is in that group. That group is people no longer infected with the virus, but still suffering. Researchers have found long COVID is associated with more than 200 symptoms across 10 organ systems, including the brain, heart, lungs and blood vessels. Long COVID patients have at least one unexplained symptom lasting longer than 12 weeks. I hope that there is going to be recovery in the future, but it's hard to know what that will be like. There's no known cure and doctors are now operating without a treatment playbook. But armed with health questionnaires, blood tests and lessons learned from other illnesses, they're trying to write one. At the same time, they're trying to help people like McLean. She's currently a patient at St. Paul's Hospital, which is part of a new post-COVID clinical care network overseeing 2,600 long-haul patients. Those tests are administered on a regular basis at regular intervals for patients so that we can then look at um, patterns and clusters and help to learn that way. Dr. Adira Levin runs that network in BC. It's early days, but Levin says what's clear is patients can't go from doctor to doctor looking for help. They need a trusted space where experts come to them. Just the notion that there is this place where people who are experts or becoming experts in this area are watching you and reviewing your case on a regular basis, that support and that listening and validating is also very helpful to patients. Hey everyone. Hey. How you doing, Derek? It's so nice to see you. At the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute, they're on the exact same track. It's another one of the roughly 20 long COVID clinics across the country. The, the fatigue doesn't really have a, a really set pattern like some of the other things do. Derek Christie is meeting with three medical specialists for a range of symptoms. So what are your primary goals for your program here? Well, I'm hoping to overcome this, this pain that I have. 
Despite taking precautions, Christy, a musician, caught COVID back in April. The virus wrecked his lungs and nearly killed him. His partner was asked to say goodbye to him twice. Now he's embracing his recovery. I'm pretty motivated because I looked at this as a big opportunity and I wasn't going to squander it. But it's all trial and error. We were just so nervous because no one had any idea. Dr. Alexandra Rendelli says no two long COVID patients are alike. We see um, a yo-yo of symptoms, so to speak. So they'll say this is kind of how it started and then it moved to this. A large Canadian survey found the top reported long COVID symptoms included fatigue, shortness of breath, brain fog, muscle and joint pain, and the list goes on. We're really able to take evidence-based information that's been studied from other populations with similar symptoms, but from a different virus or from a different pathology, stroke, MS, spinal cord injury, and take that research and bring it to our COVID rehab patients. Like McLean, Christy desperately wants to walk independently again. They're both following advice from physiotherapists, including strengthening, pacing, and heart rate monitoring. Are you comfortable in that chair? Christy is venturing into the clinic for his next appointment. Hey, well, it's nice to see you in person again. It's been a while. Nice to see you too. He's not sleeping and still experiencing shooting pains. Ah, oh. Christy's struggling, but he knows his doctor is listening and still learning. Before COVID, he was playing live music on stage, and he's determined to go back. You have to rebuild your body, and for me, it's going to take probably six to eight months just to be able to walk normally. And he's not alone. It's estimated at least 10% of infected adults will have long COVID. That's roughly 170,000 Canadians. But doctors say if this team model of care can effectively treat this wave of long COVID patients, it could transform patient care for other conditions as well. I think this is the beginning of perhaps a change in the way that we look at healthcare and how best to integrate uh, research and care in the moment. But already, wait lists for long COVID services are growing and not all treatments are covered. I really wish that all Canadians had access to like centralized um, care for, for long COVID because it's a quite a terrifying thing to go through. and. I've never experienced anything like it in, in my life. Uh, last night was the first time I actually picked it up and strummed in about six months. Christie's recovery may be slow, but new treatments are on the way, and many hope one will lead to a cure. Christine Birak, CBC News, Richmond Hill, Ontario. Next, in a CBC News investigation into residential schools, a long-held family secret, generations of trauma, and the allegations against a Catholic priest. That's where we heard the story about grandma, great-grandma getting pregnant by the priest. Their search for answers and why there may be thousands more with a similar story. And later, Alec Baldwin speaks about that movie set shooting, but he says he didn't pull the trigger. That story is still ahead. Welcome back. A Cree man says he has been haunted all his life by the alleged behavior of a Catholic priest who once ran the residential schools in Manitoba's north. Randall Aptagon says it was an open secret in his community that a priest had impregnated his grandmother when she was an underage student. As Cameron McIntosh shows us, his story may be shared by thousands around the world. Winter's coming. Even now, looking at the freezing Jack River in Norway House, Randy Aptagen feels pain. When I was five years old, I was sent to come down here with my uncle. Sent to check fishing nets in the ice. He was getting angry at me. Didn't like having to take a little kid with him down here, I guess. Next thing, he was in the water. My uncle grabbed me and he, he dumped me in that ice hole, that cold water. That, that water was one painful feeling I would never forget. It would come to represent his relationship with his mother's family, a lifetime of hostility, resentment, and alienation. 
Anytime they had the opportunity to call me a bastard, they did. Yeah. You know, anytime they had the opportunity to put my mom down, they did. Was there ever a reference to who your grandfather was? Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Like, look at me. I'm pale as pale can be, right? But they call me Pagois, which in Cree is the definition of a Catholic priest. Father Chamberlain is worried about the impact the white man's way of life may have on the Indians. Father Albert Chamberlain, a priest from Quebec, spent 50 years in northern Manitoba and Saskatchewan running residential schools and Catholic missions, including Norway House. Here he is interviewed by CBC Television in 1963. I don't think that uh, a Canadian government will let the Indian uh, try. Look, she has his chin. <laughs> When Randy and his niece Jillian look at it, they see someone else. That's how Grandma looked when she was mad. She'd have that, that don't mess with me face like that type of deal. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Mary. Hi, John. <laughs> Did you get that? Mary Uptagen was Randy's mother. Born in the late 40s in Norway House, she died in 2006, revealing a family secret. The priest was her father. And then that's where we heard the story about grandma, great grandma getting pregnant by the priest and then her getting married off. Therese Evans was Randy's grandmother. In the late 40s, she was a student at a residential school overseen by Chamberlain, who would have had vast authority. Randy says his grandmother became pregnant as a teen. And I can't imagine the fear that she must have had. He says his grandmother was coerced into marrying William Aptagon. Here they are later in life to cover up that Chamberlain was the father, an abuse of power and violation of his vow of celibacy as a Catholic priest. Elders in Norway House confirm it was known in the community. I'm a product of something that I never asked to be a part of. Uh, my mother never asked to be a part of. My grandmother never asked to be a part of, you know. Well, definitely, definitely. I... Chamberlain died in Quebec in 1984. The church he oversaw in Norway House still stands today, shuttered. While Randy considers himself a believer, he's not a church follower. The local archbishop declined an interview request, but in a statement said he had no awareness of this family's concerns and would not hesitate to meet with the family to better understand their situation and assist them. Do you think the church owes you anything, like in terms of an acknowledgement or some sort of accountability? I would say yes, but to what degree, I can't even answer because I can't even fathom that answer. My, my whole life has been affected. My course of life has been altered right from birth because of it. A seemingly extraordinary situation that's left him feeling alone. But far away in Ireland, it turns out someone else has been asking the church similar questions. Psychotherapist Vincent Doyle is the son of a Catholic priest, dedicated to helping other descendants of priests. The pattern you've described is, is very identifiable where the church try and shoo it away and arrange it in a marriage. Um, it's, it's, it's a global pattern. His book, Our Fathers, is a call to the Vatican to acknowledge a long history of priests fathering children. There's at least 15,000 children on a global level, but that would be the conservative estimate. That includes Canadian cases. That it could have happened during the time of Canada's residential school system is no surprise to Doyle. What responsibility does the church bear for individuals that are in this circumstance? They owe us an explanation for their actions over the last God knows how many centuries of pretending we don't exist. Looking through the archival record, Randy is convinced what he sees backs up his mother's story, even in the absence of physical evidence. But when you see these pictures of him, there's clearly no doubt in your mind that this is... Oh, finished. absolutely, man. This, this, this is a face that I've looked at for years. When you look at this guy, you see your family, you see some of yourself, but you also see that system. Do you feel curiosity? Do you feel disdain? Do you feel... It's got to be a lot of things. I, I feel a lot, yeah. You know, it's like, here you are, you're looking at something that's a part of you in a, that you never knew you would ever be a part of. But there it is, that's in your genes. But at the same time, you look at it with disgust, you know what I mean? At the same, you know, the feelings are mixed. Eh? All of it just raises more questions about who he is, who he's related to, 
who else this might have happened to. It continuously goes through my mind. Like, it makes you wonder how many more are out there, you know? Questions that won't be answered simply by those photos. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. CBC News continues to investigate the harm done by residential schools to survivors and their families. If you have information, you can share it confidentially with our Indigenous-led team. Send an email to wherearethey at cbc.ca or you can call this toll-free number. Next, new revelations in the Rust movie set shooting. What Alec Baldwin said in his first sit-down interview since the fatal incident, right after the break. It's been six weeks since a shooting on a film set claimed the life of a cinematographer. Alec Baldwin was holding the gun. But as we hear tonight, in advance of his first interview, that may not mean he pulled the trigger. Chris Reyes with what Baldwin is saying did and didn't happen. This photo taken just moments after a fatal shooting on the movie set of Rust has been our only look at Alec Baldwin's reaction to what happened that tragic day in October. Until now. Even now, I find it hard to believe that. It just doesn't seem, it doesn't seem real to me. The actor sat down for an interview with ABC News about what happened when a gun he was holding while filming a scene fired, shooting cinematographer Helena Hutchins and director Joel Souza. Hutchins died of her injuries. In the interview, a stunning revelation. It wasn't in the script for the trigger to be pulled. Well, the trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. So you never pulled the trigger? I, I would never point a gun at anybody and pull a trigger at them, never. The interview comes just a month after Baldwin said himself because that he I, can't say anything. I've been told multiple times, don't make any comments about the ongoing investigation, and I can't. That investigation is still active. This week, police searched a prop store in Albuquerque, New Mexico, that authorities believe provided some of the rounds used for the film. Alec Baldwin was sued for punitive damages. Multiple lawsuits have also been filed against Baldwin and others involved in the movie's production. Hutchins' husband, who tweeted right after the shooting to pay tribute to his wife, has now turned his social media account private. Baldwin has repeatedly said that Hutchins was his friend. She was someone who was loved by everyone who worked with and liked by everyone who worked with and admired. The tragedy on the set of Russ has rippled across the film industry with many productions banning guns altogether. So far, no charges have been laid in the case. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. Up next, the crew of a Canadian Armed Forces helicopter grounded by fog get quite a surprise. The troops were in BC to help with the floods and then the tables turned. Our moment after the break. Well, here's a tale. With fog and darkness quickly rolling in, this Canadian Armed Forces helicopter had to make an emergency landing on the banks of BC's Fraser River. So there was rain in the forecast. The pilot worried that maybe the river would flood, but then people showed up to help. And that's our moment. All of a sudden, we heard the helicopter landing right there. Well, there's nothing there. And next thing you know, uh, we're trying to help these guys find a better spot to land the helicopter because they literally couldn't go any more forward with the fog the way it was. It was pitch black, full of fog. We decided really quickly with the pilots what sorts of things had to be done in order to prep the area. Traffic needed to be stopped, the trees needed to be cut. Ran back to the house, grabbed a saw, cut down a couple small trees just to make sure they had the clearance. When the helicopter finally landed where they were, obviously we realized they'd been running all day. So my girlfriend we'd been visiting, we ran back up to my house and just made grilled cheese sandwiches and soup, granola bars, snacks, water, whatever we could bring for them. So I got that for as a thank you from the from the pilots. The 430 out of Quebec. <laughs> and can I say one of the little nuggets about this story that I absolutely love, the saw that they used wasn't even a chainsaw, it was just a little battery power thing that they'd picked up the week before. And one of the trees that they cut down is now their Christmas tree. Perfect. <laughs> and it didn't end there. Uh, someone from the fire department showed up with keys and said, look, these are the keys to my cabin. If you need a place to stay, there you go. Mm. That is Canada. And that is a national for December the 1st. Good night. Good night.